Who got a run? This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest tonight is Terry Quinn from the Galloway Running Group. Terry is a professor at Queens College and he teaches other teachers and also school principals. He's also a man that believes in setting goals regardless of age. So please welcome to the show, Terrence Quinn. Well, always a pleasure to see you. Nice to see you again today. Terry, as you know, I'd like to start the show by sharing with the audience a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? A little bit about your education. I was born in Queens County. In fact, I am a lifelong resident of New York City. I attended school, St. Joseph's Elementary School in Long Island City. And after that, I took something of a leap. I took the GG train after the eighth grade to Bishop Lachlan Memorial High School for four years. I was there during the Rudy Giuliani era. He was an upperclassman. I was a freshman. Our paths did cross a couple times. And after Bishop Lachlan, I took another leap called the Third Avenue L. I went to Fordham University. And after Fordham, I became interested in the whole ecumenical movement and the whole concept of interracial understanding, interreligious understanding, and dialogue. So after Fordham, I took the leap to Yeshiva University, where I went for a master's degree. Well, at Yeshiva University, I took courses at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and that spurred a 40-year interest that remains to this day in areas relating to the Middle East. Another leap I took, I guess, at the same time, I decided I wanted to explore Africa, and I studied in Africa. Uh, I've been there since. I studied uh, African economics and politics at uh, the University of Ghana in Legon, which is a small town outside of Accra, the capital of the country, and that spurred another interest. Wait, hang on, that's a lot of leaping here. I gotta catch up. Life is fun, and you might as well. At that time, I wasn't married, so I decided, let me have some fun. Oh, cool. <laughs> now, were you athletically inclined in your growing up years? I don't think I was athletically inclined. I knew the importance of physical fitness. I guess I dabbled in running. I became serious as a runner, frankly, around my 60th birthday. I remember sitting one night having dinner with my family. My daughter, Kelly, said to me, so dad, what do you want to do for your 60th birthday? I said, I'm going to run a marathon. And my other daughter, Kelly, or Katie, she just laughed. She says, dad, you couldn't run it when you were 30 or 40. And my son Justin chimed in, he couldn't run it when it was 50. And they all laughed. I said, you're right, but I can do it when I'm 60. Why? Success in life is mental. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Success in life is, is mental. And as they say, if you believe you can, you're right. If you believe you can't, you're also right. And I found Galloway, and I decided this is what I want to do. So that's what I did for my 60th birthday. And I've done three since. Every, everyone is a piece of fun. Well, we're going to cover those three <laughs> marathons because you said they probably influence your life in different ways. Yes. But, you know, before you got to 60, did you set other goals? Did you have accomplishments or stories that can you share with us that, that highlighted your future endeavors? Well, I think I had some pivotal experiences when I was a school principal in New York City. I worked in the community of Rockaway Beach, Queens. Um, I was there for 10 years. It was the greatest, most exhilarating experience of my professional career. I had large numbers of homeless children, and that can really cause some adjustments to be made in school operations because I had large numbers of homeless kids. I had an issue trying to get them into school. Absenteeism was a problem. Mm -hmm. What I did was uh, I used common sense. I went to the shelters for the homeless knocked on their doors at 7 o'clock in the morning, got them out of bed, brought them to school. You made That's you, you drove them to school yourself? Or? No, I walked them, it was about six or seven blocks away, but I just remember knocking. What was, what was the name of that high school? It was a public school, uh, 225 in Rockaway Beach, Seaside Elementary School. Okay, it was an elementary school. It was an elementary school. We what had 800 students, uh, about 800 students, went from pre-K all the way up to grade six. And you were the principal? I was the principal. How do you become a principal? You are obviously an expert in education, and you are first I've got to run. One becomes a principal by uh, one needs to be certified, take certain courses after several years of teaching. And I decided I, after teaching, I wanted to um, engage in some leadership experiences. So I studied uh, for a doctorate. I got a doctorate at St. John's University mm -hmm. and became a principal. 
so after your doctorate, you, they just promoted you to principal? Well, it was, it was while I was a principal that I decided I wanted some mental therapy in the mm -hmm. evening after the stress of being a principal all mm -hmm. day. So that's when I pursued the doctorate. Okay, and now you're a principal, and it sounds like you're having success in pulling these homeless kids into your school. Well, I enjoyed it very much. Um, that community was very important to me, and it still is important to me because my parents were Irish immigrants, and when they came to New York, they met in Rockaway, and in fact, they returned to Rockaway on their honeymoon back in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And the shelter for the homeless that I visited was at that time a hotel, and my parents visited that hotel on their honeymoon. So that ho hotel has had a great relationship uh, in, a, uh, in my entire life, and I felt every time I was going in there, knocking on doors, getting these kids out of bed in the morning, bringing them to school. I held my PTA meetings there also in the lobbies uh -huh. because parents did not come to school. Uh -huh. So we used to bring um, Dunkin' Donuts coffee and everything else there. But, uh, that was in the 60s? Oh, no. I was, this was, a, I was a principal. This was around uh, late 80s, early oh, 90s. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, so it's not that long ago. No, no. I still remember the great oh, people of Rockaway. Wow. That's, they were, that's terrific. Yeah. Were you honored in any special way for this, uh, for this achievement, or getting those kids to come to school? Regis Digest um, selected me as an American hero in education because of the work we did in our school. I just thought it was what principals should do. Kids don't come to school, find a way to get them to school. Mm -hmm. uh, Reader's Digest thought that was unique, and as I say, they made me an American hero in education. As my wife, Dolores, likes to say, it must have been a lean year. <laughs> uh, she keeps me grounded. I just like what I do, and I apply common sense to everything I do. I'm not a hero. I'm just right. a guy who was fortunate right. to work with great people in Rockaway. Well, you also wrote a book here called School Leadership. Tell us about it. What's the, uh, the, the genesis of this book? Well, Around the time I turned 60, I set three goals for myself. One, to run a marathon. Two, to write a book. And three, my third goal at the time also was to get tenure as part of the uh, process at Queens this College. Is the book you so that's the book that I wrote. Yeah, on it school about? leadership. It's just, it, it discusses and identifies a series of issues in school leadership and management, issues related to decision making, how to motivate staff, how to resolve conflict, uh, proper leadership skills, creating a, a positive culture in the workforce. And we apply, myself and my co-author, Ben Pelch, we apply a number of case studies to these issues. And that's what it's about, a series of case studies. Great. So you said you had three goals. One was to write a book after you turned 60. Yes, all within the same year. That oh, was a all the same year. year before you turned 61. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I had to prove to my kids, you know, the old man, he's still got a little life left in him. Oh, I <laughs> see. So, well, so you felt motivated by when they yeah, said... Yeah, my kids motivated me. Dad! <laughs> okay. So what was the sequence? The sequence was, um, it was running the marathon, getting tenure, and then the book. Okay. So tell us about your marathon experience. How did you go about in, in solving the problem of not able to do it at 30, 40, 50, and now you're 60? The reason I could not do it at 30 or 40 or 50, frankly, is because I wasn't motivated. I did not have the self-discipline. But um, another story, frankly, is that my parents died in their mid-50s. My father died at 56. My mother died at the age of 57. And they died of heart disease. And I remember talking to my brother Jim about it, and uh, I thought when I was 60, I have to do something uh, just to maintain my health. And I picked up on marathoning. It's, I guess it's, it was on my uh, bucket list. And once you hit 60, you thought, I guess, thinking about your bucket list, I said, that's what I wanted to do. And it was all, like I say, mind over matter. I was so, determined. So how did you pick the Galloway? Because there's so many terrific running groups in New York. I went to meet Jeff Galloway at one of his team meetings in New York. And I still wasn't committed until Bill, Bill Dysel said, I said, you know, I live in Queens County. All you guys are Manhattan people. He said, why don't you come just once, six years later? I'm still here. What changed it for you? The you... energy of the group, the sociability of the group, and the fact that 98% of its of Galloway runners complete the task. How do you deny success? So I said, so I have that, to do this. So the camaraderie is what that sucked you in oh, yeah. and, the, and yeah. the power of the group. The high point of my week is getting up, believe it or not, every Saturday morning at 5.30 in the morning 
to go into Manhattan by 7 a.m. to see you and the whole group. <laughs> the zany well, group. There is power in the group. Uh, I have to admit yeah. that the reason I get up is to see whoever I need to see at the group. I nice used to be an athlete at any age, I think. So describe the process that you went through that got you to the, to the marathon. It sounds like you were successful because you said you completed it, but tell us what the process was. The process is, it's all mental. Anyone can do the training. You just have to commit. And I committed myself. I tell my wife and my family, don't count on me to go anywhere Friday nights, because I'm busy. And I'm busy resting and getting ready for Saturday mornings. The first marathon, which you and I did, was a local marathon. I guess every marathon was a strain itself. The first marathon I ran through, uh, it was poor buckets of water. It was raining. Was that the uh, Westchester, Westchester Marathon? And I carried five pounds of water in my shoe. The I don't second, remember it, it raining. It okay. was raining, yeah. And the second marathon I did was Marine Corps, which I thought was great. Uh, and on my way back to the hotel, we were sitting on the metro with my three children and my wife. All of a sudden, I blacked out. When I woke up, I was on a stretcher being taken to Howard University Medical Center, suffering dehydration. Dehydration. Oh, so yeah. I, I remember the uh, Marine Corps. That was a very warm day, and at the end, very hot. Yes. Now, I was dehydrated. Uh, dehydrated. Now, looking back, what would you do differently to overcome that? Well, I make sure I have my electrolytes with me and I eat more bananas and potassium. In fact, my son, just that I remember, he came in from uh, wherever he was working. He, uh, I said, I'm gonna meet you at the certain, certain mile, and he gave me my bananas. Oh, this my, is after the uh, Well, this incident. is during the race. Apparently, it wasn't enough, because dehydration comes on you afterwards. Now, like I say, I wound up in uh, Howard University Medical Center. Well, it's interesting. Uh, as you probably know, I had a nutritionist on. Yes. Lauren, Lauren. Tanucci. Yes, with, with Mia. Point. And she pointed out that after the marathon, marathoners typically eat a banana and think that's enough. And what she stressed was eating a banana and a smoothie. You got to get some food into you. Well, if was that the case in your situation? Were you able to eat within that half hour window? I ate a banana. It wasn't enough. That's right. Because okay. I was dehydrated. Okay, so you're, you're the, Little you did I know. the case to, to. But I got my medal. Second lieutenant said, well done, sir. That's right. That's right. That, is, <laughs> that was worth it. <laughs> they call that the People's Marathon. Yes, yes. Great run. Yes, yes. I, 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 I cherish that run myself. Yes, it's always good. So you said you did three. Was it the third one as entertaining as the second one in terms of incidents? It was. I'd like to say it was a boring, humdrum, mundane marathon. It wasn't. Uh, this was Baltimore. And you were down in Baltimore with us. And after uh, 18 miles was great. The last eight miles, I came down with this bloody, ugly, black and blue, nasty, pussy blister. You can't quit. You know, you learn about yourself when you run. What I learned is that I'm a finisher. You can't stop after 18 miles. So what I did for the remaining eight miles of the race was hop. Oh my I goodness. hopped on one foot practically and and you finished. I survived it. Uh, of course you finish. You and can't quit. Oh, and of course, uh, marathoners or runners in particular, uh, for some reason, love to take pictures of their, their, <laughs> of their blisters. Is that the one you took a picture That's of? The, I did not take um, Lynn took a picture. I think she put it on. She called it the Quinn blister. She said it would wound up sometime. Somehow it wound up on YouTube. The Quinn blister. The really, Quinn blister. this is what friends are for, you know, to embarrass each other. Ah, <laughs> ah, but uh, so. Lynn was the group leader. I guess what group leaders are for, to, to make sure you, That's right. you remember the occasion. Yes. <laughs> oh, that was the Baltimore. Humiliating, but that's okay. It was fun. And you're, you have to have fun. I'm sure you have other great pictures of, uh, I think I recall you had the chance to run with your daughters. Yes, you got a great memory. That was a winter run. It was a snowflake run. Uh, my daughter Kelly was, must have been in the uh, a freshman in high school. And my other daughter, Katie, uh, she was in her mid-twenties at the time. And they ran with, with me. And it was great also. And, and that's, this was after you proved you, to them you could do the marathon. That's right, yeah. I, I, I remember that race. Uh, yeah. It was very cold. Yes, it was. very it impressive was. that your family showed up to oh. be with you. So that must have been a very special run. Yes, they're all special because they're all fun. <laughs> what does your wife feel about as a running warrior? How does she feel about this? My wife is very, very supportive in everything I do. 
do. In fact, uh, I was asked on a job interview for a principalship many years ago. They said, Mr. Quinn, what is the best decision you've ever made? And I said, marrying the woman I did. And the gentleman said to me, that's, the, that's an honest answer, and it's an original answer. And it was. I said that 20 years ago. I'll say it today. My wife is very supportive in everything. That's excellent. And she's also a school principal, I understand. She's a school principal, well, How yes. did you guys meet? Is there an interesting story that goes with that? She was a little younger than I was. Um, and she, I was in grad school at St. John's University. And I just happened to look up one day. And there she was walking through the halls. We had known each other from, a pre from politics in Queens County. We got talking. And 33 years later, marriage, 33 years later, three children. She's still the best decision I ever made. Interesting. So I guess your politics meshed. <laughs> Yes. Is there any interesting stories related well, to Israel or Africa? I was in um, Africa two years ago. Part of my many leaps, I guess, include community service with Habitat for Humanity. I serve on the board of directors of Habitat for Humanity in Nassau County. Two years ago, I went to Africa, back to Ghana, uh, to work on a build for Habitat. I worked in a very rural region of Ghana known as the Bolgatanga region. I guess interesting, so just, I was there for several weeks. Um, I guess the most interesting story that is, uh, that still fascinates me, I remember one evening having a conversation with the village elders, and this, in Ghana is an English-speaking country, but the area was so remote, they did not speak English, the village elders. And we, that evening we were talking about uh, the marriage customs there in Ghana and in Africa. And they said, I happened to mention that uh, my daughter was engaged to be married. She's since married to a um, great guy, Mike Redman. And they, did not believe, they asked, how many cows did I get? Your dowry. My dowry, and I said, I did not get any cows. And they said, well, how about this? Did he build you a house? I go, no. Mike doesn't build houses, nor does he have own cows. And they could not believe that a man like me, with a, a precious possession, like a female daughter, would not get anything in return. So there's that culture gap right there. It was amazing to me. Did they consider you an elder as well? Being 64, I guess so. Yeah, they were about my age, maybe a little younger. <laughs> um, but it just, I, the people of Ghana, um, I would go back again. Uh -huh. I'm an honorary member of the village of Bulgatanga. Okay. And there's a tradition there that when you become a member of a village, you should return. In 1969, when I was there the first time, I was made an honorary citizen of the village of Mempong Aquapim. Mm -hmm. And of course, you should return. That's the expectation. Oh. As the years went by, I did not think I would ever return. And then until 2008, when I had this opportunity to return as part of Habitat, I went back to the village of uh, Mempong before I made my way up to Bolgatanga. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So Terry the Elder returned. I'm an honorary citizen of the village. Uh, good people. Did, uh, did you investigate any running opportunities, or marathons, or, or take it? Kana must have been interesting uh, running territory. Kana was interesting, and uh, the group I was with, a friend of mine named Julia, who lives in California, she, uh, she recommends two particular marathons. Uh, one of them is the Safari Com Marathon. It's held in, it's in a town about 140 miles north of uh, Nairobi. What's so special about Safari Com Marathon is that it's considered the toughest marathon in the world. Why? Because you are running through the wildlife sanctuary of some big game. Lions, leopards, water buffalo, rhinoceros. The runners are protected. They're protected by trained and experienced rangers who fly over the route in helicopters. And there's also a spotter airplane, just to make sure that a lion, now lions, you know, sleep 23 hours a day. I didn't so know they, that. Well, these are things you need to know, Will. You know, you never know. 23 hours a day they sleep. And um, they were watched. And so I, uh, my dumb question is, well, what happens if a lion has insomnia? And they said, that's why, we, why you have the spotters. And they just tranquilize the lion. He goes back, and you keep going along. Now, there's another one, the Big Five Marathon.
also in Africa. The, the big, big five? The big five. The big five is so named because you're also running through the wildlife habitat of lions, leopards, elephants, rhinoceros, and I, the fifth escapes me, but... Crocodiles. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Well, you must have given some thought to doing these marathons as you memorized the animals. <laughs> well, fascinating. Have I given it thought? Well, I'll have to go back to my wife because I'll have to get her permission. She's not ready to uh, accept that part she, yet. She's supportive up to a point. <laughs> she's supportive to a point. She doesn't want to be a widow. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, what, what future marathons or future physical activities do you have in mind? Well, at the moment, uh, I, I, all I've signed up for this year is the inaugural Providence Half. It's a rock and roll. And my children are coming with me as well. Uh, we like that one. It's the inaugural. And a rock and roll is great fun because every mile you have a you know, punk, rock, reggae, soul, calypso, traditional classical music, any kind of So every mile is a different kind of music. Yes, the rock yeah. and rolls are very, very famous and great, yes, great fun. venues. But it sounds like you've gotten your daughters interested in running as well. That's, that's a very good achievement. You did a 5K or a short race, now they're going to do a half marathon. I'm hoping. That's great. I'm well, sure I have to go through. I can't quit on this one because I don't want them saying oh. that. <laughs> oh. Well, that's an interesting story about Africa. Now, what about any good stories about Israel? You said you have a great love for the country, and you said you went right. to Yeshiva University. Yes, when I was at Yeshiva University, uh, part of my studies um, had me go over to Israel, and I spent the summer taking uh, a course, Archaeology of the Negev. And so I lived in the Negev Desert, the town of Arad, for, uh, for, s for two months. Now, what part of Israel is that? I'm not familiar with that. Those names. Um, Arad is a small town within an hour of Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was important to me then, I, I was there so many years ago, they did not have a, a, a cable car. In fact, Masada is what everyone climbs when you're there. At that time, I was just being there so many years ago, we had to climb Masada. We got up at 3 o'clock in the morning. We were. Uh, we climb Masada. We were there by 6 a.m. Now they have a cable car to climb Masada. It takes away the fun and the tradition. It's a three-hour climb. Oh, yeah. You get up early in the morning climbing Masada. It was a powerful moving experience, whatever your particular background is. Another interesting story when I was there, um, the former prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, was living in Israel in retirement on Kibbutz Stable Care. And I was with a group of uh, several Americans. I was dating a girl at the time whose father was active in uh, selling bonds for Israel. And he called her up and he said he was going to pay a shiva call to Mr. Ben-Gurion after his wife Pauline died. And he said he would be there within the next day or so. And um, her father met us and a small group of us paid a shiva call to Mr. Ben-Gurion at Kibbutz Stable Care, mm -hmm. where he lived. And he looked at the group of us. He said, are you all Jewish? And the girl I was with, Amy, she said, uh, Mr. Ben-Gurion, I want you to meet Terence, Kevin, Patrick, Quinn, Irish by blood, Catholic by religion, but Jewish by nature. He chuckled. He chuckled. Excellent. That's a great story. He was known as the it's, it's Lion of Judah. Big it's bushy it's hair. That's what I remember. <laughs> David ben Gurion, the big bushy hair. And he was, I guess, if I recall, he was the first yes. Prime Minister of Israel. Yes. And, and that's such a, I've been to Israel once, and that's such a beautiful country. It's yes. amazing that such a small country has such a huge history. Powerful history, yes. Powerful people. Yeah, Israel's just, a, it's this, no bigger than the size of the state of New Jersey. In fact, I, one of the stories I wrote uh, when I came back was from desert to garden, a story of Israel. What kind of, what kind of story is that? When Israel was founded in 1948, it was really just a, a desert, but they've done so much to build the country. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, so that's why I titled it From Desert to Garden. Okay, is this a Reader's Digest as well? I don't know about that, it was Reader's Digest, <laughs> but it was published somewhere. Sounds like you're more into physical fitness in your 60s than you were in the earlier ages because you were yes. developing a family, raising a family, yes. uh, writing books, short stories, visiting Africa, Israel, meeting your wife, so forth. So what, what kind of physical activities do you do now? At, would you consider yourself well, an elder? My physical space? fitness routine is really five days a week. I do it early in the morning. I'm up by 5.30 in the morning. 
I have a, my, my New York Times and my Wall Street Journal that I read, my cup of coffee and a breakfast, and I go off to the gym or I do running. It's five days a week. I run three days and I do some kind of yoga or other physical fitness the other two days. I believe as you get older, that is the most important gift you can give yourself, which is physical fitness. And as I always say, there are three pillars of physical fitness. The first, of course, is your cardio. You gotta take care of the ticker. And you do that through running, swimming, biking. And of course, the second pillar of physical fitness is the need for flexibility. And that includes either yoga or Pilates. And the third pillar of physical fitness is some kind of weight training. Uh, and that's to prevent osteoporosis or osteopenia. And these are conditions that affect older people. So I want to make sure that I can live a, when I'm 80. That's what I want. That'll be my next marathon. Your next, but, oh, you've already got your but, next goals at it. First, reach seven. 80. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, and, I have and, to beat the family genes in that regard. Well, it's good to know that by doing sensible exercises, you're not yeah. doing anything extraordinary because although you've done marathons, you're not doing 100 miles a week. It sounds like you're doing no. sensible, no. keeping it within it's your all range. in balance. You know, success in life also, um, it's one thing to work, but you have to keep, keep everything in balance. And I've learned that over the years. And uh, my physical fitness is part of the balance. And it makes me not only a, um, better physically, but it makes me a better worker, uh, more productive. I'm able to engage in better decision making after I've had my run. In fact, many, many years ago, uh, when my daughter uh, Katie was born, my wife and I were having a party one day, and it was at 1 o'clock in the morning, 1 a.m., and I was a little grumpy and antsy because I hadn't run in like two days. And my wife went upstairs, and she said, she comes down and she said, here, go for a run. Yeah. She gave me my sneakers, 1 o'clock in the morning. I went out for a run. And how long ago was that? Oh, that goes back when my daughter Katie was born. She's now oh, 31. Oh, this is you before know, your marathon day. Sees you, yeah, but you remember these kinds of things uh, about uh, the need for physical fitness and what it does for everybody. Physical fitness is not just for the physical. It's for this, and it's for the heart, of course, everything else. But it makes you more productive, positive people. Well, on that note, Terry, Thank you so much for dropping in and sharing your philosophy and the great stories of Africa and Israel. And I wish you the great success in your, all your future endeavors. To you too, Will. Best.